Hello, and welcome back to Watching Brief for the week of the 23rd of August, 2021. I am joined, as ever, by a slightly more buoyant Andy Brockman. I think last week you were, you know, we were both a little bit, uh, a little bit depressed, weren't we? Well, not so about depressed. Um, miffed. I think miffed. To, okay, to use a miffed. mild use a mild word that you're not going to need to use the bleeper on. Um, no, I'm normally a pretty buoyant, happy sort of person. It's just yeah, that, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very, like, I'm a very happy person. Thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, <Yeah. laughs> our ongoing watching brief continues, no matter whether we are happy, buoyant, or miffed or otherwise. And this week, we are expanding on the news that we were talking about last week in the. Uh, in the shape of the closure of the archaeology department at Worcester University, or the university rather, sorry, of Worcester. Um, uh, we have, uh, or rather we fairly quickly came across the notion of bringing together some graduates from that university to talk about their career path, their uh, relationship to the university. Uh, in, in fact, they went uh, in this interview that, that we're about to see, they went to, on to talk about the university as being like a family, which uh, which I think really is the whole point of this particular interview, isn't it? It's to get behind the headline, let's see, talk a little bit about the substance of what is lost. Uh, we touched a little bit last week on the notion that there's a flavour uh, that Worcester provides to archaeology and I think in this interview we're going to see a little bit of that flavour aren't we Andy? That's right uh, it came about because uh, Rebecca Ellis who you interviewed recently in Meet the Archaeologist and who we have the pleasure of working with at the Petuari Revisited project a few mm -hmm. weeks ago uh, when we were there making a documentary um, Reb had, um, I didn't realise was actually or is actually a, a Worcester graduate mm. and when the news broke last week that the uh, the university had taken the decision to close the archaeology department she offered to get together a group of her contemporaries a group of Worcester alumni who really represent a cross-section of where people can go with a degree in archaeology mm. uh, in British archaeology mm. um, to get the, the, them together uh, on camera so that we could explore really the human side of what a course like Worcester provides the people who who take it um where it can take them and where it sits in archaeology and where it sits in the community mm. um so uh as you can imagine uh, also it was uh people are feeling somewhat emotional at the moment because of the um the situation that people in and i think that's reflected in the interview as well so anyway um it's a group of uh Four Worcester graduates. They do represent a cross section of British archaeology, um, but they are all speaking here in a personal capacity. And here's the conversation we recorded. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for for joining us for uh, our, our sort of um, in the pub discussion about the archaeology course at Worcester University uh, or University of Worcester, as we should probably say. Um, uh, let's start by introducing ourselves or your, yourselves to our audience, and we'll start with. Uh, Reb Ellis in the top left-hand corner of my screen. Who, what, what, who, can, can you introduce yourself and, and what was your journey to, in, into archaeology and into the archaeology degree at Worcester? So, hi guys, my name is Reb Ellis. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Hull and I studied at Worcester uh, doing the Archaeology and Heritage BA course between 2011 and 2014. Um, my journey to Worcester was very different to most others. Um, I was lucky enough to get into archaeology as a teen teenager through community archaeology projects in Leeds. And um, nothing in school really engaged me um, in that respect. So when it came to uni, I decided to do the thing that I enjoyed doing and decided to pursue archaeology. I actually didn't do very well in my levels, which was the best thing that ever happened. And so through the clearing process, a, bedraggle, uh, a kind of bedraggled Yorkshire student pitched up at Worcester on the clearing day into the welcoming, welcoming arms of Dr. Helen Loney, who proved to be the most amazing personal tutor for those three years. Um, and they were the best three years of my life, um, essentially. So there you go. And Victoria, how, how, how does your journey compare to that one? Um, hi, I'm Victoria, and I also studied the same years as um, Rev at Worcester studying archaeology and heritage. Um, and I came as a mature student, so um, I came in my 30s. Um, I left college with a GMVQ in travel and tourism. Um, I'd always had an interest in history and archaeology, um, but I kind of went into a different career 
kind of in the events and hotels and um yeah so I came back to it later in life it had always been an idea to come to university later um I follow in the footsteps of my mum and my two aunties that all went to university in their 40s so it was a kind of very real idea to do that later in life um so I because I had my GMBQ I didn't have the, the kind of typical A level grades to get in on the course I had to write um an essay which I, I submitted to Jodie Lewis who's um head of the course and then I was invited in for an interview um had a great chat with Jodie and um she said she used to work in a bank and she kind of came into archaeology later in life as well so she's very supportive of, of somebody doing that which was great to, to know and um, when I first arrived met plenty of other mature students so to realise that I wasn't the kind of oldest person there there was people in their 40s 50s 60s um, so it felt very welcoming um, so I was put at ease straight away. I think that's probably an issue with uh, the issue of the the breadth of the catchment that Worcester seems to have, we'll come back to later on in our conversation, perhaps. But Kat, what was your, what was your journey to Worcester? A very similar one to Vic, actually. Um, I always wanted to do something with with heritage or archaeology, and at, and at eighteen, I I did go to university, but um, due to sort of health issues, um, couldn't even really properly start. So went off and did other things: floristry, restaurants, bars, um, and then even trained to be an accountant. So um, yeah, real sort of variety of, of things along the way. Um, and then I sort of hit twenty four and was in a job that I enjoyed, um, but it wasn't you know I wasn't passionate about it. And so I kind of made the made the decision to to take the leap of faith and apply to uni. And Worcester for me, I think the focus on British archaeology and at the time I was I was struggling with health as well, um, physical and mentally, um, and w- wanted to be somewhere that wasn't too far from from where my parents were at the time, and. I applied to three different pathways at Worcester because of, you know, what was kind of on offer. And it wasn't just, um, you know, the, the focus on British archaeology, but it was the the practical assignments and, and those the real world application that you could see that would sort of come out um, of the different modules. And yeah, so I, I studied the year below these guys. Um, I started on the archaeology and heritage pathway, but at the end of my first year realised that I wanted to do a bit more sort of practical stuff and and then changed to the landscape pathway. So I graduated in 2015. And off the back of that, I started an MPhil PhD, and that was focusing on sort of one of the key areas of study um, on Mendip Hills in Somerset. And so sort of moved down to this area to, to focus on that. And again, sort of health stepped into the, into it and uh, I had to sort of suspend that for a while. And very fortunately, the job came up for um, local authority archaeologist for, for one of um, the councils in the area. And I applied with a big sort of push from Jody as well, going, no, go on, you can do this. Um, and nearly five years later, here I am. And again, I think that 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 community involvement and, and, and the um, practical work and the links to community projects and so on, we'll, we'll come back to you later in the conversation as well. Um, Dan, you, 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 your journey is taking you to a different place because you're not currently working in the archaeology in- industry, but perhaps in, in, introduce yourself to our audience first. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I went to uh, Worcester Uni at the same time as Reb and Vic. Um, I was in their year. Um, and I started very much how uh, Reb did. I went in. Um, straight off the back of college, um, went to the open day. I'd been to a few places around and none of them felt quite as welcoming, I guess, as as Worcester. Um, and yeah, the open day with with Helen um, and meeting some of the tutors and, and meeting all of eventually who all the people who became um, colleagues and friends and in effect a family um, for those those years um, at uni. Um, yeah, I wouldn't look back and and change anything really. It was it was such a wonderful time. Um, yeah, sadly I didn't stay in the in the industry um, straight away. I did do some work in in museums for a time, and um, which I was very fortunate to uh, get connections with through the university. Um, but yeah, now I've ended up with some transferable skills in a librarian job in a high school. And again, the, the idea of transferable skills and the fact that archaeologists are very employable in many different parts of the economy I think we can probably come back to again later on in our conversation but let, let, let's stick with your your undergraduate experience you you you, you rock up at, at, at Worcester for your first term um, what 
were you expecting and then what how did the experience compare to that and and uh, how did your how did your careers at the university de- develop i'll ask Kat that that question first oh it's difficult to uh, kind of say what i was expecting but whatever it was the course and and everything associated with it completely surpassed it um it's as simple as that um like i said before the kind of the real world assessments have been really really important um especially sort of third year modules where you're where you're doing things like um writing desk-based assessments and conservation area assessments you know that's something that i'm i'm working with every day in my job now but um and dan mentioned about museums we created museum labels um and we were doing artifact studies so illustration and, and sort of you know detailed finds analysis in different modules and then there was the practical side as well so there's a huge element of field work and whether that's taught so there is actually a three week placement uh, sorry a three week um sort of training excavation as part of the course and there are so many opportunities outside of that we have all worked either together or you know with other students um, on different sort of earn as you learn projects as well across the time so those skills that we've learned have, have been really important as well. Victoria how, how, how would you respond to, to that? I think yeah certainly the varied nature of the course that was something that appealed to me when I was looking for the degree course um, because I'd kind of look, also looked at kind of history or classics, or I wasn't quite sure, but that it's one thing that really drew me to the course, because we could do history mod- modules as well. I um, mean, the first year I also did a ceramics module, and I know Dan uh, did Japanese, and um, yeah. so <laughs> um, we had history lectures coming in, giving guest lectures. We had, you know, quite well reno- renowned kind of authors coming in, um, giving us lectures. We we met so many different people. We met, you know, kind of archaeologists. We were going out on day trips and meeting people in the local community that are working in lots of different roles. Um, we go to historic sites and we'd meet kind of past students. So there was a real sense for us that we could, you know, we could work in and around archaeology or heritage or something relevant when we left because we were meeting so many past students that were that were doing it. So... One one of the things that struck me covering this story is the um, the things that are in common in terms of what people are telling us. And one of them is the diversity of the cohort of students at at Worcester. And I think that's represented here among uh, among you on the the panel here. Um, And obviously the the supportive nature uh, of the department, particularly in terms of people who maybe have you know, uh, uh, personal issues of you know physical or mental health it's something that the university is uh, and still makes a, a great play of uh, how, how did, uh, did, do you agree with that that, that that thought yeah absolutely um Craigie, when i was it was between my second and third year um i was diagnosed with dyspraxia which explained my life <laughs> you know it was just kind of as a kid you know kind of like oh it's just the dumb kid in the class or, or just the kid that doesn't get things and it was finally and so yeah that um definitely that approach is to the whole person and, and it didn't matter whether you know you could write essays and get straight A's all day long or whether you were really good practically with with getting things done and, and you know like geophysics total session work etc the development was as the whole person uh, and you were treated equally in that respect. And, and also it, it wasn't in terms of like being mollycoddled about it either. You had to put that work in, like you had to be seemed to be proactive that you wanted to get on with things, which, which of course is, is, it's not exactly a lot to us. It's how it should be, but you know, you put that work in, but by God, you were rewarded with it at, at the end. Um, and that was the, the most wonderful thing. And so, when the university is now treating its staff and student cohort as it now appears to be, I think that's perhaps one of the most shocking things that we found um, during this whole process. I mean, and we'll, I think we'll, we'll come. Sorry, sorry. just going to say the staff going over and above, um, you yes. know, not giving us support, you know, through our actual studies, but yeah. we definitely all call them friends even today, you know, um, and yeah, like to think that hopefully we're doing something to to help them at the moment yes. with this campaign. Absolutely. It felt from from day one that these people that we met and there was no element of hierarchy, not that it was ever apparent really from from that open day. You knew that, yes, they would be lecturers and they would sit down and they are, you know, 
world-class experts on what they know, but they would join you down the pub afterwards for a pint and you'd sit yeah. down and, you know, you had any problems or any issues that they would talk to you and they would treat you with respect. And I suppose, I think everyone else would agree that it's a shame that the university doesn't mirror that quality mm -hmm. that they all seem to have. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, um, there's a lot of talk these days about transferable skills, about lifelong learning, about increasing opportunities for people who've maybe been in work and so on. I mean, Victoria, you, you made a point of saying you went in as a what, a mature student, that awful term. Um, but would you, again, was your experience the same in terms of the support you had as going in in those circumstances, say, rather than just going straight in from school like Rep did? Yeah, certainly, um, I guess the, the just the time that the lecturers have for us is, um, um, you know, being able to just kind of go to Jody and say, how, you know, how do I get better? How do I get better grades? And she said, well, you've got to go away and read. <laughs> read, <laughs> <laughs> um, read everything that you can. And it's like, oh, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> I'm kind of just, but just being able to kind of knock on her door and say, you know, how do I get better? Because, yeah, maybe I, I did need, I, I, it's been a long time since I'd written an essay, so I probably needed more support than mm. others. Um, so I guess it's that them just being there for you, which I guess having slightly smaller numbers in a group, we weren't sitting in massive lecture halls with 100 yeah. people. So, you know, we, we could, they could give us their time because we were... Yeah, the, the staff student ratio was always we've, it's always been a small program. Um, you know, it's not as if in terms of numbers that things have like suddenly massively dropped. Um, it's always been a small program with with an excellent staff student ratio. You know, I've been to, to two other um, I've, I've seen several kind of academic departments now, you know, only being based in two others. And the open door policy is so very rarely mirrored in the way it was at Worcester. Cracky, the amount of times like Helen must have been sick of me the amount of times I went and I went help please like you know and it was just brilliant and you were never turned away you were you know and it was they were always honest and always looked to develop you as a person it was it was great absolutely great um can I move away from the personal now and look at the the place Worcester it's obviously a town it's close to the it's a cathedral city it's a long heritage uh, of, of, of itself it's close to the Welsh borders um, it's uh, it's medieval. There's a civil war battle uh, 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 and uh, battlefield site. Um, you've got you're, you're close to those wonderful um, pre-Roman hill forts along the, the Welsh borders and so on. So it, it sits in an archaeologically very rich environment. Anyway, um, it's also part of the, uh, the uh, very close, at least on the edge of the West Midlands conurbation, uh, focused on. Birmingham but all the I mean I, I'm, I'm sat here in Stourbridge in the black country as we're recording this uh with the black country museum just up the road and Ironbridge just up the road <laughs> world heritage site and so on so yeah how, how did um uh the the, the course re um reflect both that that history but also those very strong uh, community identities that you get in the West Midlands um, it would to, to have a course sat in such a landscape. I mean, we were dragged out every other week, like yeah. you know that we were not. This was not shielded from us. We we were taught to engage. We were taught on site. Like you know, it wasn't just looking in a textbook and looking at hasher drawings. It was going out there and seeing the physical thing. And drawing so the, it yourself. <laughs> drawing it yourself. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and so the, the way you know the, the use of the landscape get the use of the local heritage assets and the engagement and learning about different ways of engagement from a professional to a community level and um, from a visitor's uh, standpoint as well it was all made of excellent use so, I don't know any other course that goes out as often as we did or for that matter um, the great thing there was there was no cost to any of these so yeah. everybody had equal access and again I don't know of, of other courses that offer that yeah um, so yeah there was that great element with it also the, the variety of the modules on offer because we yeah. had um, an industrial um, archaeology uh, module um, kind of medieval module where yeah obviously we could go out into the into the streets of Worcester yeah. um, and then the other kind of planning modules um, which were yeah utilizing the, the city that we were in yeah. it, it <laughs> gave a, a real real aspect sorry um and it gave a real um, aspect of a reality to it because i suppose when i was at school um and applying to go to university and further education and saying yeah i'm thinking about doing archaeology people really treated the, um, the course i don't know if anyone else felt like this that it was a very much a mickey mouse 
course, you know, ah, oh, they go and do archaeology. They're just going to go and learn about Time Team, and that's kind of it. Yeah, tweed um, jackets, elbow patches. Absolutely, kind of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with tweed jackets and elbow patches. No, <laughs> no, no but, there isn't. Um, <laughs> but um, to go out and to meet these people who all almost revered archaeology at Worcester as a, a place that was well renowned and that you know you could go there and people go, oh yeah, I know Jody, I know Helen, I know you know any of the lecturers and they were treated with the respect that they earned, I guess. And it, it showed us as students that there was the potential at the end of this, that there was employability. I know I'm probably I'm sat from the wrong end of that and saying, you know, I'm not in it, but the, the jobs out there, there are so many of them, I suppose, that because there there's now. so many people. Well, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean I, when this is the weird thing. When we were graduating, mm. actually, there wasn't that, many it was before the kind of all the kind of booming yeah. that's been going on now and now there is such a severe shortage that they're just mm. yeah mm. i suppose and, that in that sense it is bizarre that mm. they choose to close the course down there when there's such a demand yeah. it's mm. just so contradictory and, and strange and particularly a demand for those practical skills mm. more than yeah. anything well I, th I think again we'll return to that as we um as, as we wrap up uh, our conversation Later, I mean, for, for, for the time being, um, one of the, uh, what first of all, the thing I was going to say a moment ago, um, I think it's worth mentioning again to our audience just to give an idea of, uh, of how well regarded the department is. The uh, uh, Professor Clark Gamble of the uh, Prehistoric Society um, wrote a very strongly worded letter to the management at Worcester that was released at the end of last week, um, talking in particular about the contributions of the department to prehistoric studies and and and. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jody Lewis, in, in, in particular, um, who's um, uh, currently again, uh, I think, has a post with the Prehistoric Society. Is she, is she chair or something? I can't remember. She's on the committee. I believe. On the on, on the committee. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but but pointing out, you know, again, the the, the contribution that this non-Russell Group University is making to the archaeological world in general. Um, but. Um, were you guys um, at the university when the hive was open? Because that's that's a story that struck me. But again, covering this story very particularly, the hive is a. Uh, I think I'm right in saying the first instance in England, certainly, of a university library being combined with a public library, um, sat in the same building as, for example, the county archaeology service. So you have this in the university being a partner in this really outward looking, progressive, inclusive way of presenting a, 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 a working with the heritage of the, the area around Worcester. Um, how, how did you see that from the inside when that happened? I was very lucky to actually work the event as staff. Um, I worked for the uni and I was there when Her Majesty opened. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Yeah, it was actually the first of its kind in Europe to be a combined university and public library. And although there were questions, you know, you always get kind of, oh, is this a good idea? Is it not? What's going to happen with, you know, uh, our, our members of the public will be able to take resources out and we're not able to get hold of them kind of thing. You know, all those all, all those things were unfounded. Uh, and to have the, the archaeology, um, the, the county archaeology service also, also placed in there, particularly for us, was just brilliant the moment it opened connections were made bridges were built and neutral and and it was just a great place to be able to go into complete i know several students placements um learned other practical skills and yeah it was it was absolutely groundbreaking and it, again it just showed the progressive nature of both the course and and the then attitude of the university yeah and and that relationship is, is sort of just developed further hasn't it because I mean so many uh, we've got um students that have graduated within the last year that are just about to start work with the archaeology unit um and yeah it was it was the amount of resources available to us as well you know um the team you know the staff at Worcester did an amazing job in getting us all the resources we needed um you know access to journals and and books and websites and a huge yeah. reference collection through the the archaeology service that we were able to access as well so that was yeah, yeah amazing. and also teaching us how to access the historic environment record and that and that general well you know that practical element but also that you know this is how you do it and literally physically getting in there how many other departments do we know have such a close relationship with their local HER? And without that, I wouldn't be doing the job I'm doing today. I manage our historic environment record. So having having the GIS through the um, through the degree itself, but also working, you know, liaising with with the service 
really helped. <laughs> and another aspect of, of the practical skills that everybody we've spoken to has mentioned is the uh, the, the, the departmental excavations um, and one in particular in Somerset, which I know you were involved with. So uh, and um, so who, who wants to who wants to explain to our audience what was involved in the University of Worcester Archaeology Department training dig? I think Dan summed this up really well before. Go on, Dan. <laughs> um, um, we were, I suppose, lumped in close quarters for three weeks and worked very, 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 very hard over that time. Um, I, I suppose with our time we were there and we were in the middle of a heat wave. So it was like digging through rock as well <laughs> as the ground dried up. Um, yeah, we, we spent the time um, working hard, learning on a, a real site. It wasn't just, you know, a, a mock-up. It was a genuine site that they were researching at the time. And, the, and this is a site called Pridi, I think, in Somerset, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah just it's down down the Pridi Nine Boroughs in Mandip, mm. yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we all hunkered down into a, um, a caver's lodge together, um, bunk beds all the way. <laughs> and we would take it in turns to... Um, spend time away from the dig and clean and cook for everyone. So it was, it, it really gelled everyone together. There was no, there was no hiding away from anything from there. It was, you know, all thrills and no doors open. No doors closed to anyone, you know. <laughs> Any so. of cider. <laughs> oh, plenty, plenty of cider. <laughs> and we even went yeah. caving as well, you know, it was yeah. that kind of downtime and, and exploring mm. the local area as well. It wasn't just, you know, hard work, but mm. having kind of, been shown around by by the staff that that were there with us and teaching us those skills you know they were also mm. teaching us about the wider area and and how important those the site whichever site it was that you know a, a particular cohort is excavating how it fits into the wider mm. landscape context and and yeah it's amazing to think that we as students on our training excavations were part of you know really unraveling the kind of the complexity of, of prehistory and on the Mendip Hills and, and Somerset and the Southwest region as a whole. Mm. Yeah, and, and everybody just gelled together that there were no upsets, there were no, you know, there's no, no ridiculousness. And, and again, it was super accessible. You know, you've got students now in certain departments that have to go and pay and find their own experience. I think all we were asked to contribute was a hundred pounds. And, yeah. you know, roof over our heads, eat until we die like you know that kind of we, we weren't wanting for anything it was still totally accessible and affordable even just that small contribution and, it, and again you just don't hear of that elsewhere and there's also so with the cooking and cleaning element oh, God, yeah. um, one one former student is now actually a chef because he mm. enjoyed doing that so much mm. <laughs> slightly strange left wing <laughs> I think, yeah, in, in terms of the employability of archaeology graduates, I think that, that is the best case study I think I've heard in a long time. Um, but I, I have to, I suppose I have to move this on to sort of a, a, a slightly, perhaps a less optimistic part of our, our, our conversation. Um, we're here because the university management took the decision to close the department uh, just, on, uh, just on two weeks ago, um, which appears to have come out of very much out of left field because up until that point uh, the staff although the course was under pressure the staff were preparing new options for the university in terms of co uh, both undergraduate courses but also modern apprenticeships and uh, it was very much seen as a uh, work in progress to make uh, you know take the department in, in, in new directions but certainly to continue to to travel down the that route of archaeology at Worcester um, but what I'll do if, if I can uh, just read the press statement that the university put out and um, reflecting on your time there and then what you've seen of Worcester graduates since and Worcester's place in the sort of archaeological constellation in, in, in the UK, perhaps, uh, I'll, I'll ask you how you react to this. So um, this is from the university press office uh, and they said following the decision to to close the department. Following a declining interest in studying archaeology, which has been seen UK wide, the University of Worcester has very regretfully taken the decision to close the remaining offer in this subject. Applicant numbers have been low for several years and have now declined to a level where the course in archaeology at the university is simply unviable. We've made strenuous efforts to attract applicants, but despite the effort of colleagues concerned and the work of the university as a whole, 
The trend away from studying archaeology has proved to be deep-seated and there is no alternative but to close the offer of our archaeology course. And um, then uh, addressing concerns of students and staff, it's, they, they go on to say, the small number of students who are currently completing their studies will continue to be supported to gain their qualifications. The number of staff affected is very small and the university will make every effort to find other ways of using their teaching expertise. Teaching staff are being fully consulted. So you know, that's what the university says, but how, how do you as alumni and as working archeologists respond to that? With great so, concern. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anger. Um, also, I'd just like to come in and say that yes, student numbers were low and they are low across the country and have been for a few years, but mm -hmm. That's, you know, that has been the case and it hasn't stopped the course running previously. Also, the course at Worcester has been suspended by the university for the last two years and staff haven't had an opportunity to market any different options. So how are you supposed to attract prospective students and increase student numbers when there's no course? Hey, hey. And... Um, uh, uh, and, and again, uh, um, now the university will say that they commissioned research that uh, indicated this and that the downward trend was uh, a, a case uh, a, across the country. Um, but the other element of this, of course, is access. And we talk, talked earlier about the way that Worcester was, is situated within the community, within the community in the black country. It attracts perhaps a higher than average number of mature students. And in fact, I've seen the copy of the report, the University Commission, which says that in some respects, um, it attracts higher than average numbers to particular courses. Yep. Um, so uh, do you think that, um, do you think the university is taking this from position of, uh, is attacking this from a position of knowledge or do you sense that there's, there, there's a, an agenda, a, a different agenda in play? Unfortunately, it does appear that there is an alternative agenda at play. And the reasoning for this personally, I speak for myself here, is that if there was a, a more genuine approach to trying to deal with this, they would not have pulled the rug out from under the feet of the presentation of the new programmes, which have been two years in the making, have been on time entirely through those two years, and were only expanded with agreement six months ago. So adding extra work to meet the same deadline in an attempt to deal with the intake issue. And unfortunately, that creates a very bad image for the university because all it now looks like is as if, as if this decision was actually made two years ago. But they didn't have the grounds by which to justify it. And so they stopped the intake and then they dangled the mirage of the carrot of, a, oh, develop some new courses whilst we deal with this, you know, we'll rethink. And now a set of circumstances, which includes COVID, nationally low intake among a number of other different issues has now given them as far as they're concerned the perfect storm by which to go through with what they've wanted to do for a number of years i'm not saying that is genuinely the case i'm just suggesting that that well to be honest it is what it looks like um i can't prove it but and that is is where things have, have been particularly sour especially after the debacle with sheffield it's almost as if it set a precedent for UK higher education management to not beholden to anyone other than themselves. And that is just not supportable in any respect, no matter what subject area you're in. No, uh, you, uh, you, you, to, sorry, I was just going to say, coming back to mm -hmm. staff and students, um, they're not going to be getting, the students especially, what was promised to them when they signed up to this degree. Yep. So there are currently five members of staff three and a half full-time equivalent. And with the proposals that will be going down to one and a half. So the students that are there at the moment are in their third year. They have started work on their dissertations. With the reduction in staff, that means that there is also a reduction in the selection of modules. So uh, modules like med medieval archeology span have just been scrapped um, for the second semester. That also means that those students won't have the supervisory resource because the staff won't be there to supervise them. And there are also two PhD, two PhD students coming towards the end of their PhDs. And again, we'll have no supervisory capacity after July next year. Yeah. And the staff may be a small, you know, there may only be five, but that's still five people's livelihoods and careers Absolutely. 
and reputations that are on the line because of this decision that the university have decided to take. Yeah. And the other thing, particularly with support, I know the university have come out and said, oh, you know, well, we'll put people in place as we would say a member of staff were to leave. In that circumstance nine times out of ten there is normally at least another specialized say archaeologist even if it's not in this very specific area they're at least another knowledgeable archaeologist and in this case there won't be so not only are you creating that completely unnecessary issue for third year PhD you know what will be final year PhD students you know the most important time for writing this up and getting their qualification not only are you creating that completely unnecessary stress for them you're also planning on replacing them in a way which yeah okay it's policy but it doesn't mean it's ethically supportable and then also there's a lot of weaving and dodging here I mean when we were third year students we were not allowed to take level three modules third year modules outside of archaeology we had to specialize so why should the student cohort now be told oh you're gonna have to take some modules elsewhere because the archaeology ones can't put on and why is it supposable that remaining members of staff should have such an unethical heavy workload because they can't do the best of their ability with that there are just lots of little things here that, that clearly have not been thought through um, and, and which can only lead one to assume a complete lack of consideration for staff and students alike. Uh, and I, I'd like to just interject here. Um, our understanding at the moment, and this is subject to clarification, obviously, mm. but certainly we are being told by students who are currently at Worcester that they have still not been told officially that the department's closing. Uh, they no. found they they found out through social media. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and and the department have, have uh, not the department that the u- university have have apparently res- um, expressed regret over that. But quite frankly, they just seemed ill prepared on the on the general statement front. Anyway, what did they expect was going to happen when, when they're planning on pulling a stunt like this? It's just been poorly managed from from day one. Poorly managed. And considering these students are paying thousands of pounds, absolutely, they should have been told this well before it ever reached the realms of social media. Yep. Uh, to be told otherwise, it actually puts the university in a very bad light. And, mm-hmm. you know, we we will stand up and say, yes, we are alumni of the university. But there was an element, I guess, at one point that we were very proud to be from the university and to be alumni of that. But at the moment, it's, it's very, very complicated on whether or not I would stand and say, yeah, I, I yeah. recommend the university, especially if this is how they're going to treat staff and students with complete and utter lack of, lack of respect and just sheer disregard. And uh, now, obviously, at the moment, as we're at the time of recording, there are a number of campaigns to try and save the department at Worcester. There's a, a, an, an internal campaign, but also... Uh, campaigns in the wider world of archaeology, including Dig for Archaeology, are adopting the cause of Worcester and Sheffield and other threatened departments as well. Um, but assuming the worst case occurs and the department does close, what is going to be lost to the archaeological sector by that closure? Think. Diversity. Yep. Massive diversity, um, which... Uh, which is essential in archaeology um you know we, we're trying to push it more and more we've still got a long way to go in some respects the diversity the openness a non-russell group representative which is absolutely which it was just for, for decades punched well above its weight you know we, we were kind of saying earlier you know small but mighty um you know and it completely um restricts graduate uh, development um, sorry, graduate production, if you like, of archaeology at the time when the sector is desperate for strained staff. So there will be a further shortage in that area. And it, it's a, a complete loss of, of a leading light, quite frankly, um, in, in teaching, in research, in, in, in approach. Um, it really is a loss of, of, of a leading light. It's been said that um, the these kind of decisions are being taken by university managements um, without taking, without properly consulting the people who know about the the, the sector, in particular here, the, we're talking about the archaeology sector. So yes. that, in a sense, a, a, an important strategic decision about UK archaeology and where UK archaeologists are going to be allowed to train and how many of them are going to be able to train are being made by people without reference to the sector and outside of the sector. Are, are, mm-hmm. are you concerned by that, Victoria? Maybe uh, to mm-hmm. on that. 
Yeah, so certainly um, in my role working for the Port of Antiquity Scheme, it's a central criteria to have um, an archaeology degree. So you have to have a relevant relevant degree um, to be you know, eligible for the position. So without people having archaeology degrees, without it starting with kind of A levels, there's no archaeology A levels, and then there's a lack of um, you know, opportunities to study archaeology. I just don't know what the what the future is really. Um, and like we were saying, we've mentioned talked so much about all the practical skills that we that we learn on the course, the field work and using all the equipment and GIS. If you haven't had those skills, I guess, yeah, you've got to learn them on the job. So then it's entering jobs at a much lower level, I suppose, only being able to enter on, on a trainee level and working your way up. So Again, it's something to think about. Students have to think about going to university, the, the, the debt that you accrue, and then going in at kind of lower level positions. Um, yeah, it all has a knock-on effect, but just, yeah, not understanding where those new recruits are going to come from. I don't understand. Uh, and, and Kat, I know you're, you're involved in, in uh, campaigning on these issues, particularly uh, both Worcester and, and, and nationally. Um, how, how do you see the strategic position at the moment? Oh, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it's an opportunity for us as a sector, whether we are in field archaeology, development management, museums, academia, to all come together to fight the fight. Um, because, you know, there are voices here, there and everywhere, but we need to make a noise together. Um, so it's not like just the lack of, you know, the, the, the sort of shortage of archaeologists coming into the sector or, or going into different um, different areas, but it's pay, it's conditions. There's just so much to deal with, um, but we all need to come together. That, that's all I've got to say, really. Yeah. This could not have come at a worse time for our sector, the, all these closures on top of everything else. I'll always remember, and all these guys will remember, when the late, great Mick Aston became the honorary professor at Worcester. And he said something that always, I think, sat with quite a few of us. As a sector, we've never been particularly good at standing up for ourselves at times. Hence, we're in some of the situations we're in now. But I'd go further as to say sometimes we've been not very good at playing, uh, being a team and being coherent and being, you know, that team, you know, that family that, that we know so well, we feel mm. is missing from, from wider UK archaeology, whether that's, as Kat said, at academic, academic level, community level, everything in between. And... With the campaigns that are, are, are on at the minute and, and also where, you know, institutions like the Post Medieval Studies Group and, and the Prehistoric Society are making noise, we have to come together. You know, whether it's the Save Archaeology campaign, which I know wants to focus specifically on academia or Dig for All, which, which wants to, you know, come under the total umbrella. Unless we come together and put personal issues aside and focus on what comes after us, because that's what's going to outlast everything. And what's important here is what's going to come after us. Um, you know, what we <laughs> if we can't do that, we're not going to get anywhere. Mm. Uh, and the, saving Worcester or attempting to save Worcester, saving other departments, it's all part of that same needing to come together and, and show solidarity and, and to build those bridges and, and to build those connections. Mm. It, it's absolutely vital for our sector. Archaeology matters it's you engage with the past whether you like it or not whether you realize it or not it's a fundamental part of human society and has been for perhaps even hundreds of thousands of years mm. um you know in terms of evidence from from certain areas in the world um we have to we have to lead by example and, mm. and we have to really now start asking those that come after us are they going to say we've done enough yeah it's in a way it's a shame that the the university can't see that they have an opportunity in a way that yep. looking at other universities around that have their archaeology departments closing down, that they could actually be the showrunner for the Midlands and yep. potentially almost a showrunner for the country where they are, yep. a, you know, the place to go where you go to someone, Oh yeah, I'm thinking about studying archaeology and everyone goes, yeah, go to Worcester. Now, when, I was looking to go to university. That was a, a genuine thing. People were saying, have you thought about going to Worcester? Because their department is top notch. And for the university to forget that value is a shame. It's a real shame. Because I work with um, you know, 15, 16-year-olds who are looking at 
what they're going to do post GCSE. And a few of them do mention, you know, I thought they're going into archaeology. And I would hate to be in a situation which is becoming slightly more real now where I had the, you know, people said the same thing to me, which is don't bother. Don't bother going into it because it's not a viable career. And I, I, I've always said to them, look, I studied it. Um, I'm not in the industry at the moment, but it is a hell of a course to go on to. And there are so many avenues that you can take with that. And with the, these closures that seem to be coming thick and fast, I'm, I'm worried for those people. And as, as Reb, Kat and Vic have said, you know, we need to be looking at the, the generations below us now and almost be kind of good ancestors to them and say, you know, yeah. we've set the path, off you go. Um, you know, sorry about any mistakes, but, you know, hopefully you can learn from us. And also, um, we're not talking about a kind of niche industry. Her the heritage um, sites of the West Midlands bring in, you know, billions of revenue a year. So these mm. need to be looked after and they need people that, that know them, have studied them, understand them to to protect them so we're not we're not talking about a kind of something that doesn't bring in billions of revenues so if we're going back to money which it always you know, goes back to it always <laughs> goes back to <laughs> it feels like you know that is the university's priority but it's mm. you know but, but there's also an increasing thing. I mean, I, I work still within community archaeology and, and just how much the actual process for dig and that teamwork and that social and well-being and mental aspect is more is greater and greater and greater in terms of recognising actually what a great thing, practical work within a totally relevant research framework and done properly by mm. community members who want to learn, who want to engage with their local heritage in a slightly different way. Um, that that potential it is rocketing and, and we, we are really starting to get, get running with that again now. Um, you know, and, and, and that's the other thing. Archaeology isn't just about dirty old pots in a storeroom. There are so, it's so much more. And as a sector, we need to be so much better at celebrating that and celebrating everybody's achievements instead of the political sniping. Yeah, and we I see it through the, ourselves. Yeah, and I see it through the development management process. You know, we've with the amount of house building that's required, the huge infrastructure projects that need to be delivered to, you know, to keep the, the country standing and moving those communities that those projects affect are still, you know, even if they don't want the houses in the field next to where they live, if archaeology is found, they want to know what it is. And, you know, we need to be delivering that to those communities in a positive way. Absolutely. And, without... and look at the rise of metal detecting. Exactly. The rise of metal detecting, the rise <laughs> of um, uh, mudlarking, um, you know, all these things that require trained professionals just, you know, in terms of management level and just, you know, ensuring good practice and ensuring things are preserved mm -hmm. in the futures. You know, the, the audience for these things are out there. And for some reason, we are just missing grabbing their attention and, and moving on. And we need to work what that is out. We, we need to address so, that. So to wind up then, um, bearing those thoughts in, in, in mind, what would you, and, and say, try that awful question, keep it, keep it in a sentence, sum up in a sentence. If you have got the senior management team of Worcester, the University of Worcester sitting in front of you and you're doing a presentation about why they need to keep the department open. Uh, so what's your punchline? Why, why does that department need to survive? You know, they, they, they say they haven't, got, they haven't got the numbers. It's not viable. Why are they wrong? For me, it's diversity because, you know, <laughs> we're all a particular, we've, we've come from different backgrounds, but, you know, we are all very comfortable in what we do these days compared to a lot of people. Um, and if that course isn't available to prospective students from lower income backgrounds or, you know, different demographics, what are they going to do? What's going to happen to their passion? We're, we're going to lose input at every level. The, the the resulting closure will send ripples of ripples through the archaeological sector at every level and even if you know there is an element you have to treat every department equally within a higher education you know management god forbid we, we couldn't try and turn this this um decision around what i would then say is make sure you do ethical diligence to those that are still technically under your care you have a responsibility to do that and wiggling out of that through, you know, somewhat appropriate guidelines, et cetera, is not the way forward. If you're going to do it, at least do it properly. Slow down 
on your proposed redundancies and do the right thing. On, on the back of what Reb's saying, um, we have all been in a, <laughs> a bit of a crazy 18 months. Um, and I think the one thing that we've all learned in that time is the humanity behind everything that, yeah, we're all, we're all facing the same storm, but we're all in very different boats in very, very different circumstances. And yeah, in their statement, they say, you know, it's only a small number of staff that are going to get affected. There's still staff that are going to get affected. Small so, doesn't mean any less important. No, it, Absolutely. that is not, that is not a justification. Um, so I suppose just to sum it for them, I would say just be humane. You know, these people, these livelihoods matter, possibly not to the management, but they do matter to those people. And so if they do need to close it, fine, but make sure those people are supported and yeah. that they leave in the best possible way they can. With, with the respect of the fact that most of these members mm. of staff have been there for 10, if not 20 years. Mm. And, and built that degree. And from built them. that degree and built that wonderful reputation from day one. Mm. Yeah, I would I would say go back to the university if I was talking to them and say, what are your core values? Go right back to the beginning. What are your core values? You want to change people's lives. You can, you know, take a mature student who doesn't, you know, has got an in passion in archaeology, but you can take that person, you can change their life and you can give them a career in the West Midlands. So you can mm. take people, change their lives and give them employment, the opportunity to gain employment in the local area. So you've, um, and Andy mentioned the word progressive. You can have a progressive university that, yeah, changes people's lives, their mental health, gives them a family. You can have a, a hive. You know, here's a beautiful gold shiny building, but if it doesn't have the people inside it, the people that yeah. are using it, mm -hmm. the people are passionate about the facilities inside it, then it just becomes an empty building and yeah. that's no use to anyone. Absolutely. And I think that is probably a very good note to end on. Um, so I think um, all it remains is for me to thank Reb Ellis, Cat Lodge, Victoria, Victoria Honour and Dan Morgan for joining us on the Watching Brief. And uh, thank you very much and goodbye. So that was a lovely conversation to witness. I was sitting very much in the background, just uh, observing and recording as it unfolded. And it speaks precisely to what I was getting at, indeed what we were getting at last week when we made that rather uh, bad, although it was praised, uh, pun with regards to Worcestershire course slash Worcestershire source, in so much as what we see there and what we saw in that conversation is a, a group of professionals who are indeed professional, they're on their best behaviour, uh, the, the, yeah, even though I was happy to deploy the bleeper where it necessary, uh, th these were people who, who care, who are passionate, who are professional, who are capable, who consider themselves to be part of an archaeological family, even you know, years after graduating. And, and I have to say, for my, for my part, that's a rare thing. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, an important element of this, this flavour that's lost in the, the makeup of British archaeology um, with the closures of these sorts of departments. But also, crucially, I think that interview represents uh, a, a simmering and as I say, on best behaviour, um, challenge and criticism to a certain extent of archaeological leadership in this country. And and the, the question was being asked, and I think will continue to be asked, as to how, uh, how our leaders can better and can continue to improve in their support of, uh, of archaeologists. I think you're absolutely right in that. Um, I think... You know, one, one of the reasons we wanted to uh, do this particular chat, um, record this particular show, was to get behind the immediate headlines and the immediate uh, anger in the Twitter sphere and the uh, and, and, and Facebook and social media. Uh, to, to to look, at, yeah, uh, it's the famous line from uh, Joni Mitchell: "You don't know what you've got till it's gone." Mm, mm. Uh, now, we're at the stage now when we haven't quite lost these things. And I think it was important to show people what we've actually got and what actually might be gone yes. in the very near future, if we're not very careful. Mm. In terms of the leadership of the sector, uh, I think it is a what is happening now, I think, is a really direct challenge to the effectiveness of 
leadership bodies like the Council for British Archaeology, like the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, like the Federation of Archaeo uh, Archaeological Managers and Employers fame. Um, there are other bodies too. Uh, there's the umbrella body, the Heritage Alliance, mm -hmm. um, because it appears at the moment that strategic decisions about the numbers and training of future archaeologists, which is currently a shortage profession, is being decided by university managements without any input from those heritage bodies, from those leadership bodies. Mm. It's being done, these decisions are being, these strategic decisions, which have, will have a considerable impact, not just on the local communities, but on the, but on the, archae the wider archaeological family, the wider family of professionals who service things like the development sector, the heritage tourism sector. Um, those decisions are being made um, for very parochial reasons, it would appear, um, in certain higher education bodies. And I think that is something that needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed quickly. Hmm. Well, we will keep an eye on uh, any response that comes from uh, uh, from 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 those sorts of organisations to these unfolding events, of course, we're likely to return to Worcester again in the watching brief, and uh, I think we can guarantee that. Yes, yes, uh, and I think uh, I mean I'm not sure what next week's news will be, but whatever it is, it's all unfolding in this context of of deep big questions for archaeology and, and in particular the archaeological sector uh, in in the UK. Um, I suppose, suppose there's much else to say, really, other than thank you guys for watching. Uh, thank you for your time, Andy, as ever. And uh, until next time, do take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>